Dr. Michelle Hayward is joining us here and standing in Russian. And um, first time in politics as, well, no, at this level, but you have, you've done local politics. At this level, yeah, I've done yeah. five years as a commissioner in Ports Mary and mm -hmm. three years as chair. So. Right, so the obvious question, you know, why? Um, I, slightly frustrating. I think I could make a bigger difference at a higher level. So stepping up, you know, there's, there's only a limited amount you can do in local politics. Mm. And uh, I've seen quite a few things that I think, yeah, I could actually get stuck in. And, and the, the, with. the incumbent MHKs aren't doing, or in general? Or, you know. I, I think in general, I think there's a, almost a, a disconnect sometimes between the uh, residents and the people that they elect, that sometimes their voices aren't being heard. And, and sometimes I think there's, it's almost like government becomes its own self-serving organisation, becomes a bit inward looking and mm. doesn't necessarily communicate well. Did you learn much in local politics, though? I mean, how things can't be changed as easy as you maybe think? Or? Yeah, well, the local, uh, local politics involves an awful lot of you know, seagulls, seaweed on the beach, potholes and stuff like that. And Some might say national government also tracks <coughs> yeah, that Yeah, exactly. But well, like, um, we've spent, in Port Mary, we've spent four years talking to the DOI about the state of the high street and how bad the potholes are. And it's the mm. iris scheme that went through that's caused the problem. And we've been told four years in a row, yes, we put it on the list. Sorry, Treasury said no. Yes, we put it on the list. And then... Um, uh, an FOI request revealed that actually they'd never been on the list to be done at all. And so as a local authority, you do as much as you can in terms of talking to, to government departments to mm. try and get things resolved. And then you think, mm, actually, that's not right that w you know, we weren't even considered for the, for the repairs that are so desperately needed down there. OK, so on the doorstep, what are you telling people? What's your unique standing is, is it that sort of thing or um, it's I, I think it's that I'm a problem solving person and I, I think you know my approach to Port St Mary and, and it's you don't report on Port St Mary very much anymore and that's a good thing because <laughs> Port St Mary used to be in the news for all the wrong things but um, there's a load more sort of sensible policies in place the staff are empowered to get on and do their particular job roles without necessary political interference and and it has become about setting policy and then checking that that's followed rather than getting mm. stuck in and dealing with the, the minutiae and so I, I like that kind of let's make things work a little bit better and a bit smarter and so that people can get on and do their jobs and that you've got satisfaction for your your residents at the end of the day. Well of course that's what a area, <coughs> Russian's a bigger area than that so you've got yep. to deal with everybody. Yeah and, and poor Erin and, and Russian have their own mm. little um, issues going on as well certainly the rates issue in Russian and, and since they became Russian and Arbery the rates issue is hanging heavy over some of those residents that they might be forced to to pay more than they are currently and in Port Erin the big discussion has been about the Cozy Nook and whether it should be deregistered or whether they should try and save the building and, and, and revamp it. And uh, the, the incumbents, <coughs> you, any problems with them or you know? I know I've worked with Dewan and Lawrence quite a lot but obviously Lawrence now has been uh, stepped up to president um, yes. so he won't be around. Dewan's standing again um, and then uh, yeah I've got on both with both of them very well during the time. And what are you hearing on the doorstep the other way around? You know, what, what, anything else that um, is going on? <laughs> parking and speeding is always an issue. Um, Never and away. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was down in Colby on Sunday afternoon when there was a single car accident down there that caused an enormous amount of damage. You know, bounced off a wall, hit parked car, wrote both vehicles off in a zone that should be a 30 mile an hour zone. And I was in Croyte Cayley when somebody nearly wiped out my car door as I got out of the car, even though it's a, a controlled zone. And I think we need to look a lot more carefully about how speed we limits, protect... Speed well, Bumps? What? No, I dislike speed bumps entirely. People right. slow down for them and speed up, so you actually get more noise and more thumps out of them. But there are things you can do to perceptually narrow the road. So the changes that came in along Gansey, which weren't universally popular at the time, because the road is now narrower because of the cycle path which actually nobody uses. But because the road is now narrower, it slows down the overall traffic speed because you don't think you have enough space to get through there at speed. And so everyone tends to back off a little bit. So there are some more subtle engineering things that I think you could do that would just slow things down and make things better for the people, especially when their front doors open pretty much onto the road. You really don't want cars flying past. How have you viewed the last five years? I mean, as, as um, a government? It's, <laughs> the last five years for the government has been... I think probably challenges that they never thought they'd have to face. True. Um, equally, I think the, the climate change challenge is one that they really haven't stepped up to in any sort of timely fashion. Where do you stand on that one? I'm a scientist by background. I knew stuff that the IPCC published yesterday, stuff that I knew from 30 years ago. I think it's been there and science has been pretty solid all the way through. The old, the old man can do a difference then, you think? We should the Isle of Man should have stepped up to looking at renewable energy resources. It's fine trying to persuade everyone to drive electric cars, but we're generating that electricity 
using gas fired power stations, which is just utterly insane by the time you look at the energy losses through to the end user. Um, electric cars make sense if you're not burning fossil fuels to, to power them. So, you know, it's like a, a little step in the right direction, but we're still committed massively to fossil fuels. And in Ireland, they've just put in some sustainable housing. Their, their intention is to build 10,000 affordable first time buyer sustainable homes where the low energy usage, which would mean that the bill was around 20 pounds a month for their energy. So you'd be very pro wind turbines and... I think wind like turbines, are, they're proven onshore, technology. Onshore. onshore is much easier to maintain than offshore. And I say that from, I run a diving company, so I know what it's like being out on boats and, and trying to work at sea. The costs for doing things at sea are much, much higher. We do but have no land available. no one wants in the backyard. That's not, I don't think that's necessarily true. Oh. It's not the message I'm getting on the doorstep. I think it may have been true 15, 20 years ago that, you know, big voices said no, 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 no to them on land. But I drive through the Scottish Highlands and you see wind turbines there and there's part of you goes, fantastic. You know, Scotland powers itself entirely on renewable energy on several days mm. a month. It manages to get by with enough capacity. So if, if you were in and you got into government and yeah. such or you asked to be in, in any particular area, what would you particularly like? Um, I particularly like, I, I work as a, I've worked as a supply teacher and I worked at the Ironman College, so education is a big thing of mine. Um, I was formerly a lecturer at, at Imperial College anyway, so a, a big thing for education, but equally happy with DEFA and playing with the science there. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot that needs to go on in terms of managing the environment that I don't think necessarily has been grasped properly. Do you want to expand on that? What hasn't? Um, I think we are... <laughs> So there's consultation out at the moment for the scallop fishing industry, yeah. um, but what we've failed to do is to look at alternative methods of catching scallops. So we've failed over years to put in diver caught scallops as a sustainable, low impact uh, measure. And I've tried, but the legislation just doesn't support doing it. Um, there's obviously issues with planning and how people understand the planning system and how they interact with it. Uh, and equally, we seem to have this idea that all of the building that we need to do is going to be on a big greenfield site and it's all going to be houses that are fossil fuel you know mm. boilers and, and things like that we've got to step up from that we've got to change that as well and you, you've got that sort of thing you that you can get enough people on board because it's trouble with independence you know you've got to try and get everyone else on your ideas I mean. it is but i'm quite quite good at persuading people about you know using evidence to persuade people about what, what mm -hmm. the necessary right course is I think one of the things I've done a lot in Ports Mary is that you know every time anyone comes up with an idea we go for the collect all the evidence let's sit and evaluate let's think what our options are and you've got to sit there and look about what the costs are what the benefits are for each of those options what time it's going to take your staff to be able to deliver it so all of those things have to come into the round and to where you want to be at the end um, and I'm a big fan of, of doing that. And I think usually if you've gone through that process, people can then sit there and go, OK, I did think it was going to be A, but now I can see that perhaps option B would be the smarter option in the so long run. So very much in the tent then, not just backbenching, just you know, in there and do your bit. I'd like to roll up my sleeves and get stuck in, yes. <laughs> who, who would you like to see as the next Chief Minister? Um, that's a difficult one because it, it, it would really depend on who wants to put themselves forward. And I think being chief minister, although you're the, the figurehead, there's almost an element of you kind of lose some impact in terms of, of what you can do. And so there are some very competent uh, people like Alex Allenson, for example, uh, Daphne Kane's very competent uh, that you, know, you think would make an excellent chief minister. But it means you take them away from the impact that they're making currently. Mm. Um, and so it's almost some, like you lose that, that influence a little bit. And of course, it's just decided by you, not the public and all that sort of thing. Do you, do you mm -hmm. feel that's the right way of going? It's a tough one. I think perhaps there should be some, and we, we should be smart enough to work out a way of voting now that people could say, yes, I'm interested in the Chief Minister's uh, post, and actually you vote at the same time. And it would need some sort of transferable vote system, so within mm. your, your uh, constituency, that you voted for the two p candidates that you'd like plus the candidate you'd like as chief minister and and, and if they if they've got the most votes mm -hmm. overall that you drop them out of the race and then it would be the next candidate down that would get the mhk post so that you're not underrepresenting. i know that means creating another post somewhere in there but you're not then leaving a constituency un underrepresented by taking the chief minister out from their constituency uh, just to wrap it up uh, 
would this be a full-time position? Would you give Absolutely. up anything else? You know, other things go by the no, way? No, I'm, I'm hoping I get to go scuba diving just for fun. <laughs> in the, in see the, the scallops. Spare, spare, yeah, go and see the scallops. Yeah, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the free time I have, I hope that just, that will become just for fun. The, my own business, the, the diving business has matured now anyway, so there's staff in there that are happy to run it, and this would be my full-time job.